Welcome to episode 161 of the Women of the Military podcast. This week, my guest is Alani Bankhead. Alani talks about her overcoming her imposter syndrome and how it affected her and her military career. She is an Army brat and thought she would go to West Point and join the Army, but instead, she ended up gaining a Reserve Officer Training Corps Scholarship, ROTC, with the Air Force and served in the Air Force. She is currently still serving in the reserves today. She struggled with imposter syndrome and she can pinpoint how the struggle intensified when a colonel her senior year told her she would never commission. She used his words as motivation to prove him wrong and has worked to overcome imposter syndrome. It helped her accomplish a lot, but she also struggled with not feeling good enough. We talk about how she overcame that struggle and what she's doing today. It's another great interview, so let's get started. Season 3 of the Women of the Military podcast. Here you will find the real stories of female service members. I'm Amanda Huffman. I am an Air Force veteran, military spouse, and mom. I created Women of the Military podcast in 2019 as a place to share the stories of female service members past and present with the goal of finding the heart of the story while uncovering the triumphs and challenges women face while serving in the military. If you want to be encouraged by the stories of military women and be inspired to change the world, keep tuned for this latest episode of Women of the Military. Women of the Military podcast would like to thank Sabio Coding Bootcamp for sponsoring this week's episode. Sabio Coding Bootcamp is a top-ranked coding bootcamp that is 100% dedicated to helping smart and highly motivated individuals become exceptional software engineers. Visit their website at www.sabio.la to learn how you may be able to use your GI Bill of Benefits to train at Sabio. Your tuition and monthly BAH stipend may be paid during your training period. They are also 100% committed in helping you find your first job in tech. Don't forget to head over to sabio.la today. Women of the Military podcast would also like to thank Grunt Style for sponsoring this week's episode. Grunt Style is an American veteran-owned and operated company that prides itself in patriotic spirit. Grunt Style makes high-quality clothing with patriotic themes that wave the American flag with pride. With more than 200 veterans on staff, Grunt Style has taken the American fighting spirit and instilled it in everything they do. Grunt Style had humble beginnings starting off as a t-shirt company out of the back of their founder's car. They have since grown to employing almost 400 Americans and producing apparel for working out, everyday wear, fishing, hunting, and more. Women of the Military podcast listeners can get an additional 10% off your first order by using my discount code HUFFMAN at checkout. So go to GruntStyle.com and use the discount code HUFFMAN, H-U-F-F-M-A-N, at checkout for an additional 10% off your first order on any items. That's GruntStyle.com and use the code HUFFMAN. And now let's get started with this week's interview. Welcome to the show, Alani. I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, Amanda. It's nice to finally get to work with you. So let's dive in with why did you decide to join the military? Oh, man. Um, I guess I always wanted to be in the military. My dad was in the Army, and so I just grew up being around military spaces. And I just remember um, my dad was a professor at West Point for a little while when I was younger, and we would always go to the end of summer events, right? So like the new cadets come in and they go through their crucible and they finish beast. And there's always this long march back where they're welcomed by the community. And I just remembered being a kid kind of seeing them and just thinking it was really amazing that, you know, they were offering to sign that blank check, you know, to serve for something bigger than them. And that really resonated with me. And so from then on, I I just knew I wanted to join the military. And you joined the Air Force, right? 
I did. I thought I was going to join the army. I wanted to go to West Point, (laughs) like ever since that moment. And then kind of like fate intervened. I ended up getting an ROTC scholarship. I went to Penn State. I couldn't afford college. So I needed that scholarship. And my parents were really disappointed in the beginning because they wanted me to join the army. But I am so grateful (laughs) that I went Air Force instead. So did you apply to go to West Point and apply for the ROTC scholarship? And then you got the ROTC scholarship. And so then that was the path that you followed? So I started the application process to West Point, And then I think there was something in me that was like, you don't need to be at West Point. So I ended up stopping maybe two thirds of the way through like right when you submit for the nomination. And I had this JROTC high school instructor. I actually I didn't do JROTC proper. They had a nighttime civil air patrol class where you could get your private pilot's license that he had encouraged me to enroll in. And he was this colonel, Colonel John Clark, I'll never forget him. And he would push me to apply for this scholarship. And you know, for me, I was like, Oh, I don't want to join the Air Force, I want to join the Army. But he kept bugging me. And I had a lot of respect for him. So I kind of applied just to appease him, to be honest. But I actually just talked to him maybe a few months ago. And I was just like, Oh, my gosh, like, thank you so much for really pushing me to um, apply because it completely change the trajectory of my life. And um, I mean, mad respect to anybody that goes to any of the academies, but I just know that that wasn't the right fit for me at the time. So yeah, so you weren't in JROTC, which is a program for high school students to kind of learn about the military. But how are you connected with him as a teacher? Was he teaching other courses? No, that's a good question. Yeah. So and I don't know how it traditionally works. But this Colonel, he had a nighttime class that was attached to Civil Air Patrol, which is like a program for middle schoolers and high schoolers to learn the principles of flying and get the opportunity to get their private pilot's license. So I guess that fell under the JROTC umbrella. So I only went once a week at night. And so I didn't do the traditional, you know, marching or going to classes during the day or anything like that. It was just that night class. So yeah, that's how it was done at that school. So did you love aviation or why were you, you said you didn't want to join the Air Force, but you, you did want to learn how to fly a plane if you're doing civil air patrol. So I was just exploring different possibilities. I didn't feel particularly drawn to flying, but I was attracted to the military. And I think meeting him, I mean, he was such an encouragement to me. And so it was almost, I think, like a mentor mentee, like fatherly type relationship where you know, he really pushed me to do it. And I, at that time was just trying to prepare myself for what I thought would be time at West Point. So I had even joined the cross country team because I knew we'd be doing a ton of long distance running. And so I was just really focused in what I wanted to do in high school. And they didn't have Army JROTC, they only had Air Force uh, JROTC at that school. And so that's the initial kind of nexus to the Air Force for me. But no, during the private pilot license certification, I realized I don't want to be a pilot. And yeah, so absolutely. I knew early on, like flying was not for me. Yeah, I did a program called FAST. I don't really remember what it stood for, but it was three weeks and we learned how to solo. And I didn't really think I wanted to be a pilot. And after that, I was like, yeah, I don't really want to do this. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But, you know, I think that's such a great example of action brings clarity. Like you're not quite sure you try something, you know, some people might consider that like failure. Oh, I wasted time. But you didn't. You just got clarity around what you don't want to do. So you could redirect your, you know, energy to something that is more in line with who you are. So, yeah. It was a really fun program. I mean, I love learning how to fly. I just didn't want to do it as a job every day. Yeah. It was really fun. So you did ROTC at Penn State. And did you face any challenges while you were going through ROTC? Yes, I did. (laughs) Uh, I think we all do. Like Any commissioning source is going to have its own challenges. Um, I definitely had a few. uh, The first being obviously like my parents financially couldn't support me. So I really had to figure out my own way to get through school. And ROTC was the primary mechanism for that. I'm a little bit of a social butterfly. So I wasn't the best student while I was in college. But it's funny, I look back on that time now. And even though I, I didn't get the best grades, I see how that was really great preparation for the work that I do with people now. And so that was definitely a challenge. I also had an ROTC instructor who 
my senior year flat out basically was like, you'll never commission, you'll never amount to anything. He just really didn't like me. And that really stung. But it also drove me to I actually had my best year academically, because I was like, oh, I'm going to show you, you know, and, and it's kind of wild, actually, that experience stuck with me for years and years without me really realizing it. I I was an overachiever for a really, really long time. And I realized after I hired my own coach that I realized that voice, like it had propelled me to a lot of really, you know, awesome achievements and great places. But it had gotten to a point where I'd hit a ceiling and I needed to kind of like purge that thought and replace it with one that was a little bit more, we'll call it like life giving, I guess, you know, so rather than focusing on proving him wrong, focusing on maybe more my values and what was actually important to me rather than just listening to some voice that wasn't there anymore. So I think that was actually my bigger challenge. So that was the root of my imposter syndrome, which I suffered from like probably the worst case of imposter syndrome ever. At every job I ever had, I always felt completely unqualified for. I mean, there were times where my supervisors would call me to tell me my next assignment. And I'd be like, are you joking? Like, there's no way, you know? And so so that was the root cause of that. And um, it took me a long time to get over that. So... Yeah, I'm working on my memoir for my deployment. And one of the things that you have to do to write a good memoir, I'm learning is to go back and figure out like where certain things that happened in your life that stuck with you that like made you who you were on that deployment and that experience. And I, I really struggled with imposter strength syndrome. And a lot of it came from field training. And my FTO field training officer was a female and she told me there is no way you're going to commission into the military and like wrecked my self-confidence yeah. and I really struggled and throughout my career and I I've been working on it so that's why it's like so fresh in the top of my head but it's like her words stayed with me yes like the whole and she barely knew me she just right. knew me for those like week and a half that she had known me and it was in a stressful environment and now, I'm more an academic achiever and not a loud, outgoing person. And so those words stayed with me. And I think they had a real impact on me. And yeah. um, it took a lot to overcome that. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's so wild to hear you share your own story with imposter syndrome, because I actually think it's a really big problem, especially with women in the military, you know, I mean, we're already a minority and not that you want to be a minority, right? Like you spend so much time trying to fit in with your unit and make an impact and just be a helper, right? But I feel like if I had somebody when I was, you know, when we first started out that had brought maybe some awareness around that thought of the imposter syndrome, my trajectory would have been completely different. I mean, now I think we realize that all that time and energy we wasted, like worrying about the imposter syndrome. I mean, it's such a waste, you know, you could be using that towards building something new and incredible and, you know, something that serves our communities a little bit better. So yeah, it's, it's so interesting to me how many women suffer from the imposter syndrome. And, and I think too, when we first came in, imposter syndrome wasn't really common in the lexicon, right? Like, now with Brene Brown and, you know, concepts like shame and vulnerability, like these are common terms that we throw around, but how to implement that, you know, amongst women is a whole other issue because they have to create awareness around what that thought is and where it came from, right? Like, I don't know about you, but my story with that ROTC instructor, I didn't even realize that that voice was in my head until maybe 15 years into my career. And then having that awareness and, you know, the awareness is the most important part because you can change the thought, right? You can, I mean, I thank that Colonel because he really drove me to achieve a lot. But now in this season of my life, I'm like, nope, you know, that doesn't serve me anymore. I'm ready to grow in a different way. And and yeah, that's one thing for women um, service members that I, I am always hoping for is I'm like, oh my gosh, you have so much more potential and you're so much more capable than you realize, you know, but it's a journey for us to get to that place. Even when you're told, right, that you're like, oh, whatever, like super dismissive or you don't believe it. But yeah, so that's kind of my life mission now is helping women understand their real value and like, let's get past the imposter syndrome so you can get to work. I think I didn't realize it until this conversation. <laughs> Because I, I've been like, what about field training was so, and I couldn't quite, I've been working, I'm working with a writing coach and like, we're diving into like the origin stories and all that stuff. And I was like trying to figure it out. And it was when you said how, what his words meant to you and how it stayed with you. And I was like, oh, 
I know why Bill Cheney was so hard because she said that to me and that wasn't very nice. And yeah. it wasn't true. So it was like, it wasn't nice. It wasn't helpful and it wasn't true. And the deployment kind of taught me that she was wrong because I went on this mission with the army and I survived and I got awards. And so it was like, that was like the validation that told myself, like, you don't need to listen to her. And it's still with me today because I still remember it. Yeah. Well, you know, the truth of it is, is that imposter syndrome, um, in, in my world, we call that a gremlin, right? So it's this voice in your head that it's telling you something. And it's usually an I am statement. So like, I'm not good enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not, you know, whatever enough. And even though it feels really like crappy to hear that voice, if you sort of like sit with the voice and almost like talk to it, which I know sounds kind of woo woo, but like, sort of ask it like, why are you here? Right. And but the truth is that underneath the scary part of the gremlin is this like core value of yours that is really, really important to who you are. So like, for me, my core value that's associated with my gremlin is like my desire for excellence, like my parents raised me to do everything to the best of my ability. Um, and so, you know, having that kernel challenge my desire to be excellent really morphed that value into something like not really very great, right? And so once I understood that, oh, you're actually here because I've been trying to be a perfectionist all these years and I'm not listening to the core value of like, no, I am enough and I will strive to be excellent. That doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. I can't be perfect. And so coming to that place of almost like grace for yourself and compassion for yourself of, you know what, your best is enough and you learn from it and you grow and whatever. But so yeah, it's interesting, like how those voices and those thoughts, like really rule over us for a long time. But if we can uncover kind of the core concept and the core theme, like you really do have an opportunity to reframe it into something that better serves you and helps you really achieve that freedom and that joy. Because that's what we want, right? Is we want to live lives and careers that are joyful. We want to feel like we're kind of in control of creating something that helps other people and stuff like that. And so I did that for a long time, but under this guise of like, I wasn't good enough. So I always had to be the best at everything. And that was good. But now understanding my thought process is better. Like I just feel so much more at peace. And like, this is a way more fun time in my life. And to be honest, I'm achieving way more having spent less hours at the office, which is like super crazy. Yeah, I think this is really important to talk to talk about especially for women who are joining the military who have that imposter syndrome and to figure out like where it comes from and and if you're in the military too but I think this is just so important that's why I stuck on it and didn't just bypass it and dive into your career so let's dive into your career you did commission despite being told that you wouldn't and and we talked about how that stuck with you and affected your career so what was your career build and what were you doing so I started as a personnelist and then I cross trained into OSI. So the Office of Special Investigations is the Air Force's uh, federal agent agency. So everybody knows NCIS because the TV show. So we're the, the Air Force's version of NCIS. And so we cover um, any federal crime within Air Force jurisdictions. So we do counterintelligence like the CIA. We do terrorism investigations and felony uh, level criminal investigations like the FBI. We have bodyguards like the Secret Service. We have drug, drug task forces. We have fugitive task forces. So um, so yeah, I've been doing that. I've been in for 17 years now. I did 12 years active duty and then I switched to the reserves for the last five. But yeah, and when I was OSI, I had the craziest career. So I started running drug cases and doing some counterintelligence out in Japan. So, um, you know, making sure that like the North Koreans and the Chinese weren't stealing our secrets kind of thing. I actually deployed from there. So I went to Iraq and I worked human intelligence with special operations. So that's like in the movies, you see the people who leave the base and meet with their informant and they're giving them like fistfuls of cash and stuff like that um, in exchange for intelligence. So we targeted senior leader Al Qaeda operatives in Iraq. And so I would collect the information from my informants and hand it to special operations who would kill or capture uh, the target. What year was it that you were doing that in Iraq? Um, I was there 2010. Okay. Like that's before combat exclusions lifted and it sounds like you were going off base. So what was that experience like and 
Are there any stereotypes that you just want? I just, I always want to talk about women who went off base and got to do. Not that lots of women weren't, but you just don't hear enough stories about that. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Yes, we did leave the base. I mean, that was my job. So I had my interpreter and we were building the target packages, right? So like, who's the target? Where do they live? Where do they work? Who are their associates? Phone numbers, vehicle information, all that type of stuff, patterns of life. And yeah, at first, you know, it it was a little bit jarring being in that environment because you're getting shot at, you're getting mortared, you're getting rocketed, right? Um, I think maybe this is where a typical civilian's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. But for me, to be honest, the fear of dying wasn't really there. I think we get a lot of great training in managing risk. So, I mean, our job is inherently dangerous. We know that. Like, there's a high probability we're going to die. And actually, OSI has one of the highest rates of death in the Middle East um, because of the work that we do. Actually, the thing that scared me the most was my imposter syndrome. So I spent all six months of that deployment worrying that I wasn't good enough, that they were going to figure out that I didn't know what I was doing. And I'll never forget, there was um, a unit that... So I flew all over the northern half of Iraq, like running informants for different units. And um, there was this unit when I landed, they were like, oh, we're so excited to have you. We have this guy that is like primed for you, like no worries. But there's some legal constraints around who can run informants and who can't. And so we go into this meeting and I'm green as far as like deployment source handler. And one of the rules is like, you never, we call it drop dropping the fig leaf, right? Like you never show your cards the first meeting. You have to build that relationship and whatnot. But these guys had just primed me. They were like, oh, he's ready. He's going to be putty. It's going to be great, you know, whatever. And this guy, um, he was a very high ranking Iraqi government official with access to a lot of really amazing intelligence that we wanted. And he literally looked at me and was like, you're a woman. I will not work with women. He, and he starts talking about the Quran says women should be in the house and baby Jesus also said, I mean, it was like the wildest meeting I've ever had. And I just remembered in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally bombed this meeting and my army counterparts are here to see it happen. And this was our first interaction, like that trust I had with them or, you know, thought I had with them is evaporated. And I felt so dejected. Um, And this was even after we told them, we were like, hey, man, if you give us access to your, you know, informant network, you can take all the credit for whatever happens, all the money. Like, I mean, this was a no brainer for anybody. And so I went back to my, my hut and I was super upset. And I don't know how this happened, but I ended up getting in contact with Uh, an intel analyst back at Shaw Air Force Base. So like the rear support intel for uh, the the deployment actions. And this guy told me, he said, Alani, all you have to remember is KMH. And I was like, what does KMH mean? He's like, he says, keep mama happy. It doesn't matter what you look like, what gender you are, what color you are. These guys want to get paid because they have a wife at home that requires them to bring home the bacon, right? Maybe not the bacon in the Middle East, but you know, bring home, bring home the money. (laughs) And so I actually went back into a meeting with him. And I was like, look, you know, we're going to get access to the information that you have. Regardless, I can, you know, go outside and meet 10 other people that have the same information that you do. So either they're going to get paid or you're going to get paid. So what's it going to be? And in a second, he was just like, Oh, no, we can totally do business. And so I'm really grateful I reached out for that support, because it just gave me the you know, the encouragement that I needed. And that also reaffirmed for me, it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter that I'm a woman. I'm Hispanic. I'm short. I look a lot younger than I actually am. So these were all things I thought, you know, would cause people to not take me seriously, which was true at first. But when you realize really what makes people tick um, and what motivates people, I mean, that's all what source handling is, is pushing those buttons. So, so as far as like, yeah, dying, not really worried about it, but being really good at my job, that was my primary concern when I was uh, downrange. So all that to say, my imposter syndrome definitely took over in that moment. But um, being able to lean on an exterior resource to kind of like really shed light on my thought process completely flipped the script for me. And so so yeah, it's, it's funny, because on deployments, like I wasn't worried about being shot or, you know, bond or anything like that. But um, it was just more, I wanted to make sure I did the job, right? And so yeah, managing the risk versus re- reward was a big part of the job. There, there was another time when 
I had a boss, like great guy, but um, I'd gotten a lead that there were three uh, suicide vest bombers that wanted to do an attack on the base. And so my interpreter and I went to the boss and I was like, hey, I want to go meet with this possible informant. And my boss was like, no, you can't go. And I'm asking why. And um, at the end of the day, he was like, well, I just want to make sure that you're safe, right? Like, and my interpreter and I talked about it afterwards. And he's like, it's because you're a girl, you know, like, and I agreed that was the sense that I got. And that was really frustrating. And the lead popped up again. Again, a couple weeks later, and my interpreter and I decided to just leave the base without permission. So I'm like driving off base. I was like, this is either going to work out really well, or I'm getting sent home, right? Like, I mean, that was a big risk for me. And three hours into it, my boss is calling me like, where are you? And I had all the information. So I was like, oh, there's like suicide vest attack going to be happening here. I gave him all the details. And, and he was like, good job. We're going to talk about it when you get back. But Good job. And yeah, when I got back, he was like, you shouldn't have done that. But you know, you followed your gut and you did a really great job. And I think he understood too, like, I'm not there to be safe. I knew in my gut that this hunch was worth following up on. And so, so yeah, I mean, I had my own challenges when I was deployed as well. But that's where you're, you hone your gut and you, you just know intuitively like what you need to do. So yeah, I think that shows a really good example of like the challenge of being a woman in a combat zone and like having a double standard that leadership place on you where you're supposed to do your job, but then you're like, I have this lead and they're like, well, you can't go. And you're like, but this is my job. This right. is what I have to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm really glad that you got to share some of those stories because they were really, really interesting and important for people to hear about. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, if, if it encourages somebody, then I'm super grateful. I was deployed in 2010, too. So I was just in Afghanistan. So oh, oh, yeah, I never made it to Afghanistan. But man, it was a wild time to be in Afghanistan. Yeah, <laughs> quite the experience. Yeah, so you deployed and you went through that experience. And then you said you went back to Japan. Yes, I went back to Japan. I was only there a couple more months and then I PCS to our headquarters in Quantico. And so I was in charge of our uh, worldwide counterintelligence support to technology protection investigation. So, you know, all the like cool tech we have, like the F-22s and stuff. There are other countries that are trying to get access to those blueprints and stuff. And so my job was to manage all the 200 units that ran those types of investigations. Um, I actually saw your post on the hypersonic glide vehicles, which I also saw that. So um, hypersonic glide vehicles are one of the top emerging technologies that the Secretary of Defense and, you know, the war making components in the world are really focused on. And so, yeah, there's really big implications in that test that China conducted uh, a day or two ago. So, um, but yeah, so I did that for a couple of years. I managed a team of about 10 Intel analysts where we supported the agents with their investigations in the field. And then after that, I got selected for command. So I went to Kuwait for a year. And so my responsibility there was making sure that there were no terrorist attacks on the service members and, you know, just counterintelligence cases. We also did run some sexual assault cases because that was really when things blew up with Congress and um, sex assaults in the military. But yeah, so I had a team of about 17, 18 people in, in my unit that were responsible for making sure that all the service members were safe. And then from there, I actually got selected to be the bodyguard to the Secretary of the Air Force. So we call that a personal security advisor, um, which again, you know, five foot three, like female, like I was just like, you must have the wrong file in front of you. I didn't actually think I was going to get picked, but I did get picked. Um, and so I went to the Pentagon and I did a couple years in that assignment, traveling all over the world, protecting, you know, the Secretary of the Air Force. And then, yeah, from there, I left active duty. So why did you decide to leave active duty and transition to the reserves? To be honest, it was just the right time in my life. Like, I don't know how else to explain it other than I just knew in my gut that it was time to leave. I had 12 years in, which most people, you know, it's crazy for you to leave at 12 years because you're only eight years away from retirement. But I think there were a lot of things happening to where I realized as I became clear on my core values, they didn't really align with the Air Forces anymore. I'm not talking about like integrity and service and all that stuff like those did align. But I think just how the Air Force or at least OSI handled leading its people kind of the expectations expectations from the headquarters elements, like the culture and the environment as a whole, um, I didn't really quite fit in anymore. I really was more interested in the one-on-one -on -one engagements as far as 
not making war, which is what the military exists for, but really like lifting people up and protecting life was more my my stream. So that's why I ended up leaving active duty. And you stayed in the reserves because you put the 12 years in and it gives you the opportunity to still finish and get retirement eventually and pursue a new path. Yes, for sure. That's awesome. So what was that transition like? Was it a pretty smooth one or did you face any challenges in the transition from active duty to reserves? Um, I mean, it is scary because the military was all I knew. I grew up an army brat and then I joined the Air Force. So leaving was really scary. But I had to tell myself like millions of people have separated from active duty and they survived. <laughs> like you can survive too. But I ended up applying for a mentorship from American Corporate Partners, which they have like senior leaders from industry and all parts of you know the world that want to mentor veterans as they get out, like helping them with their resumes and stuff like that. And so that's a free service for service members that are transitioning out. And that was such a godsend because this mentor, he works in cybersecurity at a bank. And while that wasn't what I wanted to do, I still wanted to work in, you know, like protection of people and, you know, those types of spaces. So that w- that really helped um, ease the fear. But thankfully, I had a nice financial cushion I'd saved. So, um, you know, having that security blanket really cuts a lot of fear out because you're not like in a rush to get another paycheck, you know, right out the gate. So yeah, you talked about two really good things. American Corporate Partners, I'll link to them in the show notes. They're amazing, a free mentorship program. And I use them for my business. I love it. And my mentor really helped me with changing my focus and thinking outside the box on how to grow the podcast. And uh, she owned a dog store, like a dog clean or a dog kennel. So you would think like that's totally different, but she has so much advice and wisdom and was really helpful. And then you also talked about the financial cushion. And that's something that I think once you start getting a paycheck in the military, you should start planning for leaving the military because sometimes you can plan for it. And sometimes like you have an injury and you get medically separated and it's all really fast. So I don't think anyone should not have a plan for having that financial cushion. And especially when you're young, it's a lot easier to put money away. Yeah, save your money, people. You never know. You never know. So let's talk a little bit about what you're doing today. You said you transitioned in 2017. And now it's 2021, right? I transitioned in 2016, 2015, 2016. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I went to nonprofit work, actually. So I worked for um, the world's biggest anti-slavery organization. And my job was to oversee all of our Latin America investigations, operations, and uh, host nation law enforcement training. So the Latin America AOR was completely focused on child sex abuse and child sex trafficking. Um, So I traveled all over South America to do that. Um, And then my husband's active duty. So we got orders out to Hawaii. And so I had to leave that job, which I was really upset about. Um, And at that point, I started my coaching business. But then also, I still had that like just itch. And so I started volunteering at the local Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, which um, I had done ICAC investigations when I first came into the uh, into OSI. I really loved uh, protecting kids. Like, you know, we worked drug cases, I did terrorism, I did a bunch of different things. And like, those are all great mission sets. But like working investigations of people who abuse children, like I had extra special gusto for those. And so I just started by volunteering with them. You know, I figured like I had my business, I'll work one to two days a week and just help them out. And then my boss offered me a job. And because I had the business, I was like, well, I'll only work part time and I pick my days and my hours. And if I don't want to do something, I'm not going to do it. And I I get to telework. And I didn't think he was going to say yes, but he was like, Okay. And so it's just so, so wild. And I think such a great example of like, also what we think a career looks like, right? The traditional model of like, you do 20 years with one organization, like, you know, is slowly fading away. And like, we, especially now, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the great resignation and like all these people are quitting their jobs and stuff. Like, I think people want more out of work than just like going to work and dying, right? So being able to like envision what a perfect career looks like for you. And like ask for that is completely possible. And so I had this hybrid career that I really love because working child exploitation investigations is really, really tough. Like you're in the pit of humanity dealing with the worst kind of person. But because of my skill set in operations, I actually 
created these two operations here. So Operation Keiki Shield is the state's enticement operation. So Keiki means child in Hawaiian. Um, so Operation Child Shield. But if you remember To Catch a Predator, um, it's our version of To Catch a Predator. So you have law enforcement officers pretending to be kids online and there are adults that want to meet up with them to exploit them sexually. We've arrested close to 60 people on that operation over the last about two and a half years. And then I also run Operation Shine the Light, which is our missing and runaway foster kid recovery operation, because those kids are at a higher risk of being trafficked and stuff like that. And so I think that's another example of you get to create the life in the career that you want. And so, you know, it's such a privilege for me to look around on operation days and realize that like there are 50, 75, 100 people working hours the night because you invited this tribe to like come together and collaborate and protect kids. So these are salt of the earth, amazing humans. And I'm just so grateful that I had the courage to imagine it and like make it happen. And so, yeah, so the coaching is the balance. Like it's such a joyful, happy space for me that when I'm feeling really crummy about, you know, the, the difficulty of the work and child exploitation. Yeah, so it's just a really good balance. And most people might look at that and think it's weird, but it works for me. So I don't really care what other people think. But so yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. I think that's really important. I'm in a point in my business where I'm trying to figure out what's next. And I also am like, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. Do I need to like push myself to do more? And if I do, what is the right thing to do instead of like, oh, this is a good idea and just run with it. So I've been taking my time and doing lots of deep dives and looking into where I want to go next and how I can build the platform that I have. And my job isn't traditional, but it really works for us and my family. And I love it. So people don't like it. Right. And that's such a great point too, though, is how do we define success for ourselves? Not what the world tells us success looks like, which traditionally is like promotions and bank accounts and stuff like that, right? But kind of these qualitative measures of like, you know, what influence do I think I need to be having in the world? What am I doing to make the world a better place? So what does success look like? And you know, for you to come to a place of like, I'm really content and can I do more? Yes. Do I need to do more? I don't really know. So I mean, these are really great advanced questions (laughs) that, um, you know, if you have that courage to define your life on your own terms, like, you know, these are amazing problems to have. I have a business coach and she really helps me stop and think about stuff. And before I had a business coach, I would just be like, idea. And then I just run, like spend all this energy. And then I was like, I don't even know if I wanted to do that. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Yeah, I think, and that's another great point, actually, like coaches. I don't know why I thought life coaching was a joke. Like the first time somebody suggested to me I become a coach, I like snorted, right? I'm like, oh, is that a real thing? Like who does that? But after having my own coach, like, I agree, completely blew my world wide open as far as helping me to identify for myself what works best for me. And like, I don't do regrets, but I'm like, man, if I'd had a coach, you know, back when I was in college or when I first joined, like my life would have been really different. And, and I know, you know, my accomplishments, people are like, oh my gosh, you've done so much. But to be honest, my imposter syndrome means like, you know, it's still with me. And sometimes I look at my resume and I see my failures. I don't see the success of what I've achieved. And that's going to be a lifelong thing that I'm always working towards. But yeah, coaches are just so amazing at pulling these like truths out of you. And, um, and yeah, I'm just, I don't know why in the military, we don't use them more. I feel like they're starting to get on the bandwagon a little bit. But yeah, she came up with four questions. And like, the first one is, do I want to do this? And then it goes through like, do I need to do this? And like, all these questions that I never asked, I would just be like, opportunity. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so that's aligning with your values, right? Of like, what's really important to me. And I think too, like, there are a lot of great opportunities, but some are meant for you and some are meant for other people. And if you know what your mission is, then you can just focus on those, those things. And then the other good things are meant for someone else who has, you know, a really big passion for that. So that's, that's a really great point, actually. Yeah. So we're going to run out of time, but I really love this conversation. But my last question is, what advice would you give to young women who are considering military service? Oh, my goodness. I have so much advice. Um, I think the biggest one would be, you know, when I think about myself, when I was about to join, like, I was so apprehensive and nervous. And you know, we all want to do well and be successful. And sometimes you might question like whether it's the right choice or not. But I would just say like, 
you know what's best for you in your life. If you feel like joining is the right thing for you, like dive in head first and enjoy the ride. That's something that I didn't really do very well the first 15 years of my career. I was so busy moving from achievement to achievement because, you know, everything is promotion focused and evaluation focused. And I never took time to like be present and look around and be like, whoa, I'm in Iraq working with special operations, doing stuff I see in the movies, like protecting life and saving lives is the hope, right? Like I never, I never did that. And so I would just say like, be present, like build relationships with the people around you. Don't fear or feel like you don't fit in because your unique qualities is exactly what the mission needs to get done. um, Whether someone tells you that's true or not. Like even when I was running informants, I thought being a female and brown was a disadvantage, but actually it allowed me to go into places in Iraq that my white male counterparts couldn't get into. And so that was a really big asset to the mission, but I had to get over my own ego to be able to do that. Right. So, so believe in yourself, like there are no mistakes in how you were created and what you were meant to do and just enjoy it is what I would recommend. I love that advice. It's so good. And I'm really glad we got to do this interview. So many good points and such an interesting experience in the military. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for what you do and just like encouraging the female service member and veteran population. It's such important work. So thank you. Thank you. listening to this week's episode of women of the military podcast do you love all things women of the military podcast become a subscriber so you never miss an episode and consider leaving a review it really helps people find the podcast and helps the podcast to grow are you still listening you could be a part of the mission of telling the stories of military women by joining me on patreon at patreon.com slash women of the military or you can order my book women of the military on amazon every dollar helps helps to continue the work I am doing. Are you a business owner? Do you want to get your product or service in front of the Women of the Military podcast audience? Get in touch with the Women of the Military podcast team to learn more. All the links on how you can support Women of the Military podcast are located in the show notes. Thanks again for listening and for your support.